Uh, surely you've been following the news this week. Nancy Pelosi shoved through the House the Equality Act. Now, I think it's going to experience some very stiff resistance when it gets to the Senate. Uh, because of the filibuster rule and, and everything in the Senate, they'll have to have 60 votes to get the Equality Act to pass in the Senate. Now, if you've watched over the last year or so, there are a number of so-called Republicans who are more than willing to work with the leftists. I suspect they do not have 10 that will flip, but you never know. You just never know. Now, here's the thing that I want you to think about. We are 10 votes away in the Senate to the eradication of freedom of religion in the United States of America. Now, here's why. It's not because we have any hatred toward those who live uh, lifestyles that we believe the Bible teaches are sinful. It's not that we think they ought to be persecuted, slighted in any way. I do not believe that. In fact, I think we ought to love all people the same. When you go to 1 Corinthians 6, you find all of the sins that uh, most of us are guilty of at least a few on that list. You may not be guilty of all, but you're guilty of some. So you and I both find ourselves on the list, right, of those who will not inherit the kingdom. So it's not a matter of we think we're better, we think they're more wicked, but the Bible specifically targets sexual perversion and in particular homosexuality and lesbianism as being sins that God calls an abomination. Now to show you how serious sexual sin is, it can disqualify a God-called pastor from being able to pastor. That's how serious sexual sin is to God. It doesn't mean that that pastor lost his salvation. But it does mean that he is now disqualified not to preach, but to pastor. Now that's how serious God considers biblical sexuality. Now there are a lot of reasons for that of which we won't get into today. But you realize that the Equality Act would make any kind of sexual orientation now part of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which would therefore create an atmosphere where if a church, for instance, forget about private businesses, if a church refused to hire someone based upon the fact that they are a practicing homosexual that, a, that that church believes is a sin, that person has the constitutional right to sue that church and the leaders of that church responsible could very well be fined or do jail time. Now that's how serious the Equality Act is. Two years ago, Paul and I were part of an effort that we called Gone Too Far. You remember us talking about that? We could not gain any traction. None of the major Christian ministries around the country, you start naming them, whether it's AFA, FRC, you name them, none of them were interested. We couldn't get any of them to help us. We did a press conference in Washington, D.C. We had a decent turnout, but primarily because one of the local churches really encouraged some of their people to be there. It was a pathetic turnout if you talk about religious leaders. Now, you know that Family Research Council, led by Tony Perkins, is headquartered in Washington, D.C. In fact, they're just a few blocks away from where we held the press conference on Gone Too Far. And it was them that we were highlighting, and it was, it was actually some black pastors who called Paul and myself and said, listen, this Equality Act is one of the most egregious things that has ever happened in American legislation and we think we need to speak out against it and as black men we probably can speak more freely than even some of you men that are lighter in tone <laughs> a little lighter brown and uh, so we said you're right because this is going to affect everyone and of course the black pastors were very offended that they would claim that any sexual preference is equal to skin color you realize that skin color you have no choice about. Thank you very much. You have no choice. By the way, um, whatever that was, Dan, whether it was my stuff or yours, it just reminded me, we need to turn the um, Internet off on this PC before we start service, so help me with that. So, you know, you're born with your skin color, right? You're born with your sexual orientation, even though now we're told that there are over 60 or 70 or 90 genders. Figure that out. So the black pastors were very offended 
that they would try to equate sexual preference, something you can choose to do or not do, with something that you are born with inherent characteristics. But it just passed the House, and it's 10 votes away. You know that all of the lefties, maybe with the exception of uh, Manchin, will vote for this. And they'll probably put so much pressure on him, although I've been quite surprised uh, this first month that he's kind of held his ground, at least philosophically. Now, he hasn't been put to the test yet on a vote. But here's the problem. You get 10 Republicans to flip, or even if you can get nine and somehow tie this thing up, you know how Kamala Harris is going to vote. That's how far away we are from being in such neck-deep litigation and the government coming down on the free exercise of religious conviction that we're talking almost like 1935, 1940s Germany stuff. That's how close we are. So that's the thing that you need to be praying about, and I think that's why a presentation like what I'm going to do in the uh, main service is resisted in every way possible by the spirits that are fallen because they want to destroy, not America, yes, they want to destroy America. But always notice, what is their real target? Where are their crosshairs really pointed? The gospel. The gospel, the church. That's where they're always pointed. Now, they may have to hit a few targets before they get to the church, but it's always the gospel. It's always the gospel. That's why uh, um, the evolutionist, help me, I'm drawing a blank, Darwin, thank you, Charles Darwin. That's why Charles Darwin was so bent on finding an alternate explanation for the existence of the universe and of life because he had a bone to pick with God. If you've studied his life, that was his problem. And so he needed an alternative where he's not accountable to a supreme higher power. He wanted that. This is what Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and all of them are all about. They don't dislike conservatives nearly as much as they dislike the gospel. It's the gospel. It's an affront to them. Next Sunday I'll be preaching. I'm going to be preaching about the offensive gospel. And basically, I'm going to be asking the question, well, what gospel is there that's not offensive? I'm going to be talking about that because Max Licato, two weeks ago, just came out and apologized to the world for offending those who live a perverted lifestyle based upon what he's preached. Max Licato. I'll have the letter on the screen, and we'll talk about it next week. And I'm going to be talking about how the gospel by its very nature and definition, is offensive. And when you and I try to take the offense out of the gospel, there's no gospel left. Notice that Pelosi doesn't have a problem at all with the ecumenical movement. She doesn't have a problem at all with Muslims. She doesn't have a problem at all with Buddhists or any other group. She and Schumer and her whole, their whole gang, what they have a problem with is evangelicals. Evangelicals, that's the problem. So, this is what we've been talking about for the last few weeks. Now, you know that uh, demons, fallen angels, were once faithful angels. So, they re retain some of those basic characteristics. We were talking about them last week. We got to this one, and I was only able to give you one passage of Scripture that I wanted to point out. Because like the, the, the faithful angels, fallen angels have a personality. We must understand that we're dealing with beings, not a power, not a movement, not a thought. Demons are not thoughts. Now for that matter, for years Baptists were afraid to talk about the Holy Spirit, and we would often refer to the Holy Spirit as it. The Bible never calls the Holy Spirit it. The Bible calls the Holy Spirit He. And He is equated to the other two members of the triune Godhead. Well, he is a he because he is a person. Well, it is the same with demons. The same with the faithful angels. They are beings. They are personalities. So last week we looked at this one verse about the man who lived in the Gadarene or the Gergesene area, depending upon uh, which uh, 
accounts you're reading. This story, by the way, appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. When you look at these different accounts, you find that each one of them focuses on a different part of the story. Now, some have said, well, there's biblical contradictions. No contradiction whatsoever. One of the accounts lists one man. In fact, two of the accounts list one man. Matthew lists two men. Now, the reason for this probably is because uh, Mark and Luke focus on the one man who has his demons exercised who wants to become a disciple of Jesus. And so they focus on that one man. But Matthew tells us that there were uh, actually two men who lived out in the, the cemeteries, out among the, the graves, and he would scream and wail and cut himself. And Jesus approaches him. Now, this is the Luke passage, and the Bible says that when he, meaning the man, saw Jesus, he cried out uh, with a loud voice because he recognizes Jesus, and he says... Um, I beg you not to torment me. But if you go to some of the other accounts, for instance, if you go to the Matthew account, notice all of the pronouns that Matthew uses in this same story. Now here he talks about there met him two demon-possessed men. So he's focusing on both of them because he's focusing on the actual exorcism, the demonic power, whereas Mark and Luke are focusing on the one who wanted to be a disciple and they're talking about the they're focusing on the life-changing power of Christ and the gospel whereas Matthew is focusing on the fact that Jesus had power over the demons it's just like two reporters or three reporters when they report on a story they may emphasize different parts of the story and even though their stories don't talk about the same thing that doesn't mean that their stories are in contradiction it doesn't mean that a couple of them are lying it just means that they're emphasizing different parts of the same story that's what's happening here so whenever you find these so-called biblical contradictions they're not contradictions at all if we'll just use a little bit of gray matter, we can figure it out very quickly. So notice, I'm not going to read this whole passage, but notice how the pronoun they, we, us, them, are used by the demons themselves. What have we to do with you, Jesus, you son of God? So notice that you have these, these personal pronouns. Then you go back to the Matthew passage, and even though uh, this is not... The, the uh, man who has the demon cast out of him in the Gadarene area. This is later on where Jesus is talking about ge generically when an evil spirit has left a person. Notice what this evil spirit does. Jesus says, he goes through dry places. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. This is the demon speaking. So you have these pronouns being used. And then one other uh, reference is in the book of Mark. In Mark uh, uh, chapter 1, Mark tells us about a demon-possessed man that shows up at the synagogue when Jesus is there. And notice as he cries out, let us alone. Obviously, there, there's more than one demon there. Let us alone. What do we have to do with you. So notice then these, these personal pronouns. And, and the reason why this is so important is because it just, it just emphasizes the fact that just like the faithful angels, the fallen angels are personalities. They are being. Now, it's also important to note that they have names. In Scripture, we find at least two names of demons given. First of all, if you go back to the story of the Gadarene man who had the demon in him, Jesus carries on a conversation with the demon, probably the head demon. There are different levels of demons. You remember when, when we just had that passage up there, Matthew 12, Jesus says, When an evil spirit departs from a man, he goes back, he finds the place cleaned up, so he goes out and finds seven other demons more wicked than he is. Meaning that there are levels within the demonic uh, army, we, which we would suspect because we saw that there are different levels within the faithful angel uh, uh, army or, or uh, uh, sphere. So it, it shouldn't surprise us then that there are, there are different demons with different authorities. So probably Jesus is talking to this demon who was the head of 
many in this man because remember, he says, what is your name? And the demon says, Legion. Why? Well, because many demons had entered him. And remember, a Roman legion was somewhere approximately around 7,000. So if that's what the demon meant, then this man had some 7,000 demons in him. No wonder that he was such a ferocious individual and, and such a demented, perverted, troubled man who could not be bound with chains or ropes. I mean, it's just, it's just a terrible, terrible thing. So, uh, legion. And then when you go to the book of Revelation, you find that in the bottomless pit, probably the same place that Peter is referring to, that he uses the Greek word Tartarus, which means a prison cell for demons. We talked about that in our first lesson on, on uh, the fallen angels. These demons that are placed in the bottomless pit who will be released during the great tribulation. They're placed there because they are so extremely wicked that apparently had God allowed them to roam free like the others, they'd just destroy everything. Because that is exactly what they do if you'll read in Revelation 9 once they are released. They go out and start destroying mankind and the world around them. So they've been imprisoned all this time. And notice that they have a king over them. We talked about it a few weeks ago. The Hebrew name is Ab Abaddon or Abaddon, depending upon how you want to pronounce it. And then the Greek, uh, the name is Apollyon. So it's the same person, just a Hebrew or a Greek name. Notice name. So just like I believe all of the faithful angels have names. One day we'll know each one by name. No matter how many of them there are, we'll have forever. And you'll know all of the angels by name. And you will have such an expended, uh, expanded mental capacity that you'll be able to remember billions, trillions of names. I do a good job remembering my own from time to time. But just imagine remembering the names of billions of angels. And not only will you remember their names, you will know them. We'll have all eternity to get to know them. Well, just like they have names, just like they have personalities, so do the fallen angels. Now remember, in our study on faithful angels, we saw that there are three components to personality. If something is going to have personality, it has to have three things. It has to have intelligence, it has to have emotion, and it has to have a will. Those are the three key components to personality. And if you don't have all of those, you don't have personality in the sense in which we're referring to it here. All right? So, do the fallen angels have intelligence? Well, we've already read some passages where it's obvious that they do. Go back to that one where Jesus shows up in the synagogue and uh, the man who's possessed, the demon speaks through him and he says, we know you're the Son of God. Well, that, that speaks of intelligence. If you look at Luke chapter 8, the demons say the same thing. What do we have to do with you, thou son of God? They have great intelligence. In fact, I would suggest far more intelligent than the most intelligent of human beings. I don't know who you would consider the most intelligent person who's ever lived, but a lot would say uh, maybe Einstein well, he would be uh, uh, elementary, his, his knowledge to that of demons. Uh, if, you, if you look at uh, the book of Acts, there was a young lady who was demonically possessed who would follow the apostles around and she would speak out, the demons would speak out and say, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim the way of salvation. Now, why do you think she would be saying that, or why do you think a demon would be saying that? Well, because he's causing trouble. The, the same reason that um, sometimes there are troublemakers in the church who are actually saved people, but they either blah, 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 all the time too much, or they're always a problem, or why do you think demons would mess around with equipment if they do, and I think personally they do, there's one sitting up there right now running some of it. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> hey, that's the first time I've done that, Dan. Felt good. Anyway, 
that this young lady was a hindrance, even though what she's saying is true, she was a hindrance. So apparently she was blurting this out when Paul and the others were, are trying to minister. She's blurting this out. Can you imagine that there he's preaching or teaching and she just jumps up and starts blurting this out all the time? See, when you read this, you think, well, what's the problem with that? And yet Paul cast the demon out of her so she'll shut up. Of course, secondly, of course, to, to, to free her from this oppression this possession that she is suffering from. But, but she's blurting this out. So you can just imagine how obnoxious that would become, you know, if, if just jump up all the time. Uh, over the years, preaching in different churches, there have been times when there would be a person in the auditorium who would just couldn't contain themselves and they'd just jump up and start talking sometimes. And you're, you know, you're always excited if somebody is enthused about what's going on and they want to get up and shout, you know, praise the Lord or hallelujah or all that. But what if about every two minutes, Charlie Meadows just jumped up, got in his chair and started yelling, whoa, like this. Linda is on my foot, something like that. I mean, but even if he was saying praise the Lord, but just every, you know, minute or so, jump up and, and, and wail that out. It, it would get to where you, you couldn't have a semblance of service. This is kind of what was going on at Corinth, by the way. This is why Paul really rebuked them in, in Corinth in, in 1 Corinthians 14, because they just had a three-ring circus going on. People just jumping up and talking and giving a prophecy and speaking in another language and interpreting and all this kind of stuff. And Paul says, look, this is crazy. God is a God of order. He's not, he's not nuts. See, there's one right there, Sharon. She's standing up messing us. And by the way, she's fresh in off of a safari. We're so glad to have you. <laughs> yeah, see? It's terrible, ain't it? I got to get all this out so God can use me in the, in the main service. So notice, what she's saying here is true. So it's obvious that the fallen angels have intelligence. And then what about emotions? Well, again, we've already read passages of Scripture where the demons in Jesus' day were terrified that He had come to torment them. And one of the demons even, even said, before the time. Now, we'll get into that later. Not today, but in another lesson. The demons know their fate. And they, they can sense, though they can't tell the future, they, they can read the Bible. They were in heaven, so they're privy to a lot of information. They're in the spirit realm when they want to be, so they're privy to a lot. And they know kind of the signs of the times better than we do, which is really sad. Because Jesus said we ought to be able to know the signs of the times, but we don't. He rebuked the Pharisees in his day because they didn't know the signs of the times. He said, you can tell the weather, you can do all this kind of stuff, but you can't tell the signs of the times. You can't, you can't sense the spiritual condition here. Well, the demons can't. But then James tells us that the demons believe and tremble with fear. Well, that's an emotion. Now, a lot of people are surprised to know that demons believe. Which is very important to note. It's what I call demon faith. I've had a lot of people over the years say, well, I, I believe. Well, great. But do, do you mean by believe, have I entrusted myself to Christ? Or do I just believe? Intellectual assent. I'll never forget a man who was dying of cancer. He had a brain tumor. I kept visiting him in the hospital. His name was Billy. And over the next few weeks as he deteriorated in his health, I kept trying to witness to him. He had lived a very rough life. Everybody in, in Poto, Oklahoma called him Billy Jack. And he was a rough end. But now cancer had beat him down and he wasn't so tough anymore. And I finally got him to talk about the Lord. And just hours before he died, he said, I believe. And I said, now, Billy, does that mean that you've trusted Christ? You've asked him to come into your life. You've surrendered yourself. You know that you've been born again. Or does it mean that you just accept what the Bible says about him? He said, well, I believe and I think that's enough. Well, I'm afraid that Billy went into eternity with what I'd call demon faith. The demons believe so much they tremble. Billy wasn't trembling. So it could be that these demons believe stronger than he did. Now, I don't know. I hope he did actually trust Christ. And it was more than just intellectual. I hope that he really had given his life to Christ. But my point is, demons believe and tremble. So there's the emotions. And then last of all, they obviously have 
a will. I keep going back to these same passages because they are windows into the spirit realm that I think are helpful to us. So notice, so they begged him, meaning they begged Jesus that he would permit them to enter these swine. Remember we mentioned that apparently they seek so much to have a body. Now that may not be what this was all about, but it appears that it could be. But notice they begged him. They obviously have a will. They, they, they know that the Lord's will is more powerful than their own, but they have a will. They don't want to leave this man. And, and they tell Jesus, well, if you're going to force us to, to leave him, please let us go into these pigs. It speaks of, of, of a will. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 27. When Jesus was speaking, uh, they all said, well, what is this? What new doctrine is this? From what authority he even commands the unclean spirits and they obey him. Well, that once again speaks of will. Probably the greatest example, though I won't go into it because we've already spent enough time on it, is Lucifer. Ezekiel tells us in chapter 28 that uh, Lucifer was perfect until iniquity was found in him. He exercised his will. In Isaiah chapter 14, we have the statements that he made. I will, I will, I will, I will. does it five times. I will. Well, he's nothing more than a created angel. At that time, was in the process of becoming a fallen angel. Granted, high ranking as he could possibly be, but he's a fallen angel. So that speaks of will. So what you have here is you have intelligence, you have emotion, and you have will. So again, uh, we, we, have, we have shown that the demons have a will. In Luke 4, we have another example of uh, this, this very fact. So what we're dealing with here, when we talk about demons, we're not talking about uh, ghosts, uh, we're not talking about powers, they have power, Paul talk, calls them the powers of darkness, uh, Jesus calls Satan the prince of the power of the air, but they're not just a power, they're not just a force, they are beings. Now, why do I keep driving this nail so hard? Because we must understand that the spiritual is not some far off freaky deal so weird that we can't relate to it and that we're not dealing with something tangible here. Yes, we can't see the demons unless they manifest. And Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians that they can. Quite often they manifest as angels of light to deceive us. But we're dealing with persons here, with personalities. Demons are real, just as real as all of us in this room. And, and I think sometimes we forget that. Now, we don't need to go around fearful of demons. We don't need to become such authorities on demons that all we talk about is demons and all we talk about is what the devil's doing. I, I know Christians that, that they give the devil so much credit. I often wonder if they think God does anything. I'm thinking of a person right now who's a believer, been a believer for years. And when I talk to this person, what they typically do is tell me everything the devil's been up to in their life. And that may be true to some degree, but maybe God's been up to more. So we have to be very, very careful here that we don't make the mistake of going too far, as, as I warned at the very first of this part of our series. All right, so point number two on your outline. Demons are perverted beings. Now, I'm saying some things that you'd say, well, duh. Well, but we need to understand what we're dealing with here and probably... No more pertinent than the, the, what I opened up this class with. The Equality Act and the whole idea and the whole movement in America that no matter what you do, no matter what sexual perversion you practice, no matter how leftist and against individual liberty and life and all of that you are, it's okay. The only thing that's not okay is to speak for Christ and to, to say what He said. Now that's not okay. But everything else to them is okay. You can murder pre-born babies left and right. They'll do everything they can do to protect a person's perverted desire to murder these little babies. 
They'll fight for it like everything. But even Republicans, you try to do something to actually end abortion, not just talk about it like the pro-life movement has gotten to where that's all it does, just talks about it all the time, talk, 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 talk. They pass legislation that does basically nothing. It's time for bold action. Boy, they'll step right in. They'll stop that. It's a really, really sad thing. So understand the perversion and where all of this is coming from. Now, I don't think wicked people are only doing their wickedness because demons are perverted. But we must understand that there is, there is something called perversion or spiritual uncleanness. There's something called wickedness. We've lost these words in our vocabulary in the church anymore. We don't talk about evil. You don't hear pastors much preaching about the need to repent. See, repentance is something that, that deals with wickedness and evil. And evil and wickedness are things that you repent of. All we hear from most pulpits today is how God wants to make you a better you, give you a better situation, come through for you, uh, uh, grant your, your requests in prayer and your, your statements of faith and you claiming it. And, and, you know, there's some truth to some of that. But unfortunately, that's pretty much what the gospel has become in most churches. I, I'm telling you, every week, almost every day, I have someone either by phone, for the, through a phone call, a text, or an email, or I actually talk to them face to face, who are grieving over the fact that they can no longer find a church in their area that will actually preach the whole counsel of God and will not preach about perversion and wickedness and the need to repent and be forgiven. They don't preach about judgment. And no surprise, all of their celebrities are that way. Again, I don't want to, to steal the, the thunder from next week, but look at a guy like Max Lucado that I've had respect for for decades. Now, crumpling. And he's not the only one. He's just one of the latest Christian stars to, in my mind, fall. I won't quote him anymore. Probably the last time I'll quote him is next Sunday. And if I quote him from then on, I'll be quoting what I quote next Sunday. Until he repents. Now we're all in need of a good dose of repentance. So don't misunderstand. I don't think I'm better or more holy than anybody else. But I'm telling you, there is a difference between day-to-day -day struggling with sin and living perversion. If you don't believe that God hates perversion, just jot it down, Proverbs chapter 6. And you go read Proverbs 6, where God says, Six things I hate, and a seventh is an abomination to me. An abomination. And read what those seven are, and translate that um, Old Testament, about 5th century B.C., into modern America, and see what those would be in 2021. I'm telling you, God uh, is, is convinced of perversion. So, let, let's look at demons. First of all, the Bible clearly says that they are spirits of darkness. Now, you know all of this, but Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul warns us, we are not wrestling with flesh and blood, which is all most Christians do. They just fight each other. Flesh and blood, flesh and blood. Church fights, church splits. That's flesh and blood fights. Paul says, that's the wrong fight. It's the wrong fight. He said, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Notice then that there is darkness. It's not just different shades of light. Now darkness is a different shade of light. None. But see, if you listen to modern preachers and Bible teachers and folks who claim to be Christians, they talk about, oh, it's just a different shade. They're, they're just a different version of Christian. No! There's light and there's dark. Now, I will agree with you that we all struggle back and forth in that in-between area, and there are these gray areas that we struggle with. But if we're struggling with them, typically that means that they're not as gray as we think they are, and they're more to the dark side than they are the light side. It's called sin. Now, there are different degrees of sin. Obviously, having negative thoughts about your friend is a lot less serious than, than stabbing your friend to death. Which is a thought that has occurred to you guys lots of times on Sundays, I know. Anyway, 
So we just need to understand that they are spirits of darkness, but they are not just spirits of darkness. The Bible says that they are unclean. Unclean. Matthew 10, 1, when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them what? He gave them power over unclean spirits. As Christians, we're, we're all in the sanctification process where God is making us more like Christ. That's a battle. It's an ongoing battle, right? It's a constant fight. To the degree that we're submitted to God's will, the more sanctified we become, the less we're submitted to God's will, the less sanctified we are. doesn't mean we're less saved, less sanctified. And we all have sinned. All of us. On a daily basis, even this morning. When you sin, how do you feel? Do you feel unclean? Yeah. Yeah, if you're truly saved, you do. In fact, I, I do a, a message, I've done it over the years, and I don't know if I've done it here or not, but, but five or six proof tests to know whether or not you're a Christian or whether a, a person that you know and love is a Christian. The Bible gives us actual tests that you can take. And one of those tests is, how do you feel about sin? If you can tolerate sin and it not bother you, and you're actually trying to see how much you can get away with and still call yourself a Christian, stop calling yourself a Christian. You're not a Christian. Now, I don't have time to go into this, but 1 John says that clearly. It's not just my opinion. 1 John says that. So notice they are unclean spirits. Mark chapter 1 verse 23. Now there's a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. Luke eleven twenty four. 24. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man. Luke eight twenty seven, And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. A place of decay and uncleanness. They are drawn to this. That's why when Christians that I know have friends or loved ones who constantly feel drawn to places of wickedness. And they say, I don't know if that person is a Christian. I'll tell you they're not. It's not that I can judge their hearts. I don't even want to try to judge their hearts. But if a person wants to spend more time around spiritually unclean than they do spiritually clean people, they're not a Christian. Notice, this man's possessed, and where does the demon push him? To a place of decay and corruption, the tomb. Far more then than even now, because we have a way of, you know, kind of cleansing everything and sterilizing. But this is, uh, this is what they are. They're also evil now, you know this, but they are evil. Now, why is it that it's important in a study like this that we go, we go through this exercise? I think because we need to become more comfortable talking about darkness, spiritual darkness, spiritual uncleanness, evil. Friends, things that are going on in Washington, D.C. are evil. They are evil. But I'm telling you, much of what's going on in a lot of churches is evil. Because it's a perversion of the truth. And people are sitting in pews and they don't know and they want to know, but they don't know what they don't know. There was a family here last Sunday. It takes them an hour and a half to get here. And they said, Dan, is there any church in our area that you know of? I could only give them the name of one pastor and I'm not even sure about that church, just how outspoken and committed they are to these issues. And they said, well, I guess we'll just have to drive an hour and a half to church. Isn't that pathetic? All right, so they are evil. Let me give you just three verses on that, and then I'm going to dismiss us. I'm just going to throw them up there all at one time. Uh, Luke 7, 21, and that very hour he cured, he cured many of infirmities. Of course, this is Jesus, afflictions and evil spirits. Ephesians 6, 12, going back to what Paul said, against spiritual hosts of wickedness. That's the same as evil. Matthew 12, 45, Jesus about this, this demon that left this man. Then he goes out with, uh, and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. Let me tell you, I, I, I've been kind of blunt here this morning, and I sometimes maybe more than I ought to be, but people like Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and their ilk, they're more than different. They're wicked. They are wicked. Now that Jesus died for them and they need to be redeemed. But if they are not, they're going to split hell wide open. And we need to stop hedging. Now we don't want to be 
But we don't want to be mean to people. We don't want to be ungracious. But we've, we've got to use these words. And so if we can't use them about the fallen angels, we're not going to use them about anybody or anything, right? So we need to become more uh, comfortable. Hold on to that outline. Obviously, we're not finished, but we're almost to the end of it. And I'll have a new outline for you next time.